Welcome, everybody. Uh, the presentation is entitled The Tikva Program at Camp Ramah, 50 Years of Inclusive Camping and Still Evolving. My name is Howard Blass. I'm the director of the National Ramah Tikva Network. And as I'll explain, Camp Ramah is the camping arm of the conservative movement of Judaism. And we have camps in the US and Canada. And you'll be hearing a lot more about that in a moment. I want to begin by talking about how, how Judaism has related to disabilities long before our camping movement started. And I think you'll find this source to be very interesting. Uh, this is a source from the Babylonian Talmud. Um, as you may know, the Talmud is the oral law written down. It's the discussion um, of the rabbis, the Babylonian Talmud. Um, it's a very extensive work. And I, I find the source very interesting. I'll give you a summary. Um, it essentially is talking about a biblical source in the book of Leviticus that explains that the priests who would bless the congregation like this would, uh, would be disqualified from service if they had some type of blemish or a physical defect of some sort. And it seemed pretty clear cut. Yet the rabbis came up with a very, very creative workaround. And the, the summary is, that in these various towns, rabbis figured out that if a person's hands had been defective, or if they had something wrong with their eye, or other, um, other problems like that, they should have been disqualified. But the rabbis kept saying the part in yellow, the townspeople had become accustomed to him. Or in Hebrew, the im hayad dash bi'iro mutar, it was permitted. What I think this is teaching us is that the way to deal with differences and discomfort around differences is to actually include people, not to exclude them. It's really our problem. It's upon us to become comfortable by having them as part of our community. So sometime in the late 1960s, uh, this couple, Herb and Barbara Greenberg, had what at the time was a pretty radical idea. Some might have said a crazy idea to begin including people with disabilities in a typical Jewish summer camp. And as you can imagine, in the late 1960s, this was not something people were really thinking about. Um, in fact, when the people dismissed it, people in the Jewish camping world and everywhere said it will ruin the level of Hebrew, which was very popularly spoken in these camps. It would disrupt the structure of camp. It would bankrupt the camps and the, the normal people would leave camp. And um, it looked like it was a non-starter, except that one director, his name was Donnie Edelman, said, we'll take it, this is the right thing to do. Um, why should these Ramah camps exist if not for this reason? So 1970, the first camp, the Tikva program it's called, opened up in Glens Bay, New York, and it soon moved to Palmer, Massachusetts. And as you can see from the map, this experiment turned into more than just an experiment. It really stuck. And what started off as one camp in 1970 in New England, turned into another camp in Wisconsin and another in California and in Canada. Some of the other names like Atzma'im, that means it was a vocational training program. Breira under that is an inclusion uh, service or program. And then the next two were family camps. Those are all things that I'll talk about in a few moments. If you fast forward to 2017, when NorCal, Northern California, started their program, you'll notice there was a huge change of attitude over these 50 years or so. When Rabbi Sarah Shulman, the, the director, and her board were considering the program and considering opening camp, they said, we're not going to even open camp without the TICFA program. They had seen the benefits of having a disabilities inclusion program in camps, they felt so strongly they didn't even want to open up their camp without this program. So I begin by saying something which may be pretty obvious to this audience. Why is summer camp, why is it good for everybody? And if you've ever been to summer camp or had kids who've gone to camp or grandkids, we all know about camps, just having all these wonderful experiences like bonfires and arts and crafts and singing and all of those fun activities. Um, in a Jewish summer camp, the, the whole camp community spends, they have Shabbat services, Sabbath services. 
in a beautiful outdoor environment. Um, people learn prayers in a very natural, informal way. Um, our camp brings 50 Israelis to each camp as uh, shlichim or emissaries. And kids get to have relationships with Israelis. They get to see the range of perspectives and people who live in Israel. Um, of course, there's personal growth and independence. You're away from your parents, you're, nav you're negotiating, living, living quarters, making friends, bunks, showers, all of those things. You learn how to be flexible. You get to try new things, new experiences. Um, most people don't have a climbing tower in their backyard or the chance to do paper cutting or pottery. And of course, you get to be part of a meaningful community, or in this case, a Jewish community. So then the obvious question is, well, why is summer camp great for people with disabilities? And the answer is exactly for the same reasons it's good for everyone. In addition, it's a wonderful language-rich environment. We don't offer speech and language therapy, yet it's a 24-7 almost environment for language, uh, for learning, for social conventions, for interacting with the rest of, you know, this is not uh, only campers with disabilities, they interact with neurotypical peers. Um, many families say that they're, if they have a child with a disability, they don't get to have the Jewish environment. Here, it's all around them. And what I want to really focus on for the, for the majority of this talk are different models of serving campers with disabilities. The first model is a specialty camp. Now, that it's important to say from the outset, Ramah does not offer specialty camps. That would be like a cancer camp or a camp for children with cerebral palsy only. Um, that families of kids with those um, special needs or medical conditions will argue that it's in many cases it's the only chance to be with people like you, to see other people experiencing the same medical or medical condition or disability. Uh, Ramah has not gone in that direction, but what we we do have the the model that we have uh, in a lot of camps is a camp within a camp. And I will really go into great detail. Um, it's really a separate division with separate bunks. So in the camp that I know best, I spent 30 years at Camp Ramah in New England, um, as you can see from the, the campers on the left, um, we call the camping program Am Yitzim, which means the brave ones. And um, it's, it's the name of one of the divisions. It's a mixed age division of 13 to 18 year olds. Campers can come for four or eight weeks. I know this may sound like a very long time. For many, many years, campers came for a whole eight weeks. Um, the staffing ratio is very good. Usually, uh, two ca usually two campers, sometimes three, um, maybe six to eight campers per bunk. So they have more living space. They have only single bunks and not bunk beds. And the important thing to note is that it's, it's on the same side of camp as the campers who were their age. So it's not off in some disconnected, isolated area. It's really part of camp. And we're going to find out that the day is very, very structured, both for the campers with disabilities and for the neurotypical campers. And essentially, what you might expect at a camp, you wake up. In a religious camp, they have a period of prayer, about 30 minutes, breakfast, bunk cleanup. The order of the activities can vary from year to year, but that you have your swimming and there's an informal Jewish learning uh, component, sports, lunch, a rest period, important for the campers and for the counselors, um, different electives. It could be digital photography, woodworking, drama, boating, things like that, singing and dancing, um, sometimes a, a work sampling period, a free choice period, and then you see the rest. Um, again, these are taught by, um, by experts who come to camp to teach those content areas. Um, a question that parents and others often ask is just how, how inclusive or how separate is this program? And I like to explain that the whole model of camp is that each age group travels independently through the day. So for example, if you have three of your own children, ages 9, 12, and 15, your children won't really see each other very much in camp. They may pass on the walkway. They may eat meals together. They may have camp-wide activities together. But you're essentially separated by division. In contrast, in the Tikva program, in Amitzim, in the Disabilities Division, um, they travel as a mixed age group together, the 13 to 18-year-olds, um, through the schedule that I showed you earlier. 
The difference is there are some very intentional periods of the day which are, which are done with other divisions. So as an example, the neurotypical 14 year olds can choose as an elective to do sports with the TICFA program. So that happens on, a, on an everyday basis. That may happen during a swimming period. We have the option to push in campers with disabilities to another division. So if you're a great dancer, or if you're a great singer, or if you learn at a higher level in Jewish studies, you could be part of that division. So an, a model which is very similar, but pushes it a little bit further, um, takes place at our Camp Ramah in Wisconsin program. The difference being that the campers with disabilities share cabins with campers without disabilities of the same age. So the 15 year olds have a cabin on one side is Tikva, on the other side is the other program, the other the neurotypical kids, the counselors share a common area, there's porches and other common areas that, that are the same. Um, and then another going even further on the continuum, I've included two different pieces, Tikva support program and full inclusion. So um, one of our camps, one of our newer camps, Ramad Darom in Clayton, Georgia, they actually, um, it's not so much a division that travels all day um, together. Rather, they sort of farm their campers out to the typical divisions, kids their same age, with staff to support them along the way. So that's a bit more inclusive by design. So if a camper needs to opt out, that camper can go with a counselor and have some chill out time. But they're really with, the, with those campers all day long. Some of them spend nights in those bunks, others come back to their own separate bunks. Now, um, going even one step further, um, I put the word you know, inclusion program um, in quotes because somewhere in the early 2000s, some families approached me and they said, you know, would you consider a full inclusion camping program? And you know, we had known about inclusion in education. The parents said their kids were included in the education system. They wondered if we'd think about it in a camp setting. The truth is there was really no literature um, on such a, such a program. And we, uh, we were you know, interested and curious, and, but we wanted to be thorough and careful. And we hired um, an, an education professor. His name was Spencer Salen at SUNY State University of New York in New Paltz. And he became our partner. And, and got us started. And we started very slow. We didn't know what was, gonna, what, what was gonna come of it. We had two campers that first summer, one camper ended up being sent home for a variety of reasons, but we were off to a, we were off to a start. And now how many years, 17, 18 years later, it's grown to at least 25 participants throughout the different divisions. And we'll talk about the successes and challenges in a moment. First, the logistics. Most of those bunks have three counselors instead of two. They're all considered inclusion counselors or really just counselors who have this extra level of training. Uh, we actually made some of the bunks physically accessible. We retrofitted bathrooms and put up ramps. So we have had some kids with physical disabilities as well. There's an inclusion specialist. There's extra training and ongoing training. So some of the successes, as you can imagine, is really that full participation across all the different uh, camp programs. Uh, the the um, sometimes the campers know best how to sort of figure it out and make accommodations. Uh, the campers see beyond the disability; they see friends and not disabilities. In fact, sometimes it opens up the the neurotypical campers, gives them the opportunity to talk about some of their challenges. You know, that one will say, you know, I have anger management problems or I have a really hard time reading. So they begin to see that we all have strengths and weaknesses and challenges. Um, benefits in the, when it's working, it helps change attitudes camp wide among campers and counselors. It can lead to being more involved in the disability world outside of camp. Some people even go on to, to choose careers in those areas. Um, maybe they're sitting in the grocery, standing in the grocery store at the checkout and they see the person working has Down syndrome and they kind of make the connection and they're a little bit more um, understanding. They remember their camp experience. Uh, it's not without challenges. That's to say there are challenges to inclusion in camp. Um, you know, camp is tough for everybody. You know, anybody who's ever been to camp knows that it, it's certainly not home. You're sharing a bunk with 12 or 14 kids. You have very little personal space. You're sharing 
showers and you have to wait your turn and you have to learn how to be modest in a group setting. These are not things that come so easily to a lot of people with disabilities, someone on the autism spectrum who has a hard time reading social cues. It's, it's tough. Sometimes they don't actually become friends, but just tolerated. There could be resentment that a certain camper is taking up too much counselor attention. Uh, sometimes relationships, sexual issues come up. It, it can be very difficult. In the early years, I remember an experience where a division head wondered if when we were going to take the, when the kid was going to go home. It wasn't working out. That, that obviously didn't work out very well, but it, it, we've changed that attitude, I believe, over camp. Sometimes these issues extend past camp. Um, people don't know what's the limit on how much to text someone or write to them once on Facebook. And, um, you know, do you include that person in, in their bar about mitzvah, a life cycle celebration? Just some of the observations that we've had over the years. It definitely seems a bit easier in the younger years because everybody comes in fresh. Those uh, gaps aren't so great. By the time you're 16, the day is less structured. Um, people kind of pair off into their social groups. They're faster and hard to keep up. Um, you know, we always worry about um, everybody needs to have a good summer. You don't, you don't want somebody to impact negatively on somebody else's um, summer. Um, I think for sure that invisible disabilities are more difficult, meaning if somebody uses a wheelchair, if somebody has Down syndrome or Williams syndrome, it's more obvious. But somebody with autism who you know, looks like everybody else it can be more difficult. Um, we've tried to have the, uh, the support person be aid and fade, not a one-to-one, -one, not a shadow. Um, I think that you know inclusion, you know, it is, it's really an attitude and an approach. It's really not um, a program, and it could look many, many different ways. So that's um, that's TICFA support and and inclusion. Now, the founders of the program, uh, early in their early years, they realized that there would come an age where campers would need to um, age out, sadly. So they responded by starting, even when I was a counselor as early as 1984, I remember they had a pre-vocational program, which turned into a full vocational training program. Um, and as you'll see here, um, this is Camp Ramon, New England, but now in all the camps, uh, there's a, a training program. Half the day is spent at a job site in camp, half the day is spent working on uh, social skills or regular uh, camp activities. So again, in Camp Ramon, New England, there, there's, a, there's group time, there is a personal fitness time, a Jewish studies period, a chance to work on electives and learn, learn hobbies, ways to occupy your time. At the same time, a person may work in the guest house or in childcare or in a cafe or dining room, many different things. And they're living, <clears throat> they're living in a building known as the Voc Ed building, which uh, they live in rooms with peers, but not with a staff member. The staff member is down the hall. There's a living room, there's a, a kitchen, a washer and dryer. So they work on cooking and other sometimes computers, other independent living skills. And they also have peer buddies from the staff. So again, the parents wondered, well, what happens when they age out at let's say 22, 23, 24? And we created um, a staff hiring program. We used to give it the inelegant name of post voc ed until some self-advocates said, well, why are we called that? Why aren't we just called staff? Which is a very valid point. So that's why I put post voc ed in quotes. It's really a staff support program where the participants like this young man, Jason, he receives a full salary, he works in the guest house, he even trains people um, in the guest house. They have days off, they can, they can go to staff programming. And some of them can stay for many, many, many years. We're trying our hardest to partner outside of camp with employers, though this is a difficult area. A final area that I wanted to um, bring up is our family camps. In that initial slide, you saw that uh, several camps have something called Orlanu or Tikva Family Camp. And this is really something that we're very proud of. Uh, you can imagine a lot of families of kids with disabilities have sadly felt left out in their, in their Jewish communities. I assume this is the case in other faith communities as well. Um, if people are, are in a quiet contemplative moment of prayer or singing and a person has a meltdown or screams or runs around, you get a lot of shushing and a lot of um, eyes on you, and it's devastating. And you may not find yourself back at a house of worship. 
So family camps were created so that families, the whole family unit, uh, the child with a disability, siblings, parents, sometimes even grandparents, will go away for three or four days to our camps in the off season. Um, there will be tons of activities. Uh, there's a one-on-one -on -one chaver, like a, uh, a friend, a buddy, assigned to each person with each family. So the person with a disability has a one-on-one -on -one person to hang out with when needed. The, the peers, the, the siblings have support groups and fun activities. And most importantly, the parents get to do what you never are allowed to do at camp. You can have a glass of wine and cheese with your spouse. You can have a private moment with your spouse. You can talk to other families. You can learn, you can swim, you can climb, all of those things. So that, and that also becomes a um, referral source for our camps down the road. Just to get into, a, just to highlight a few different aspects, especially as you think about developing your own programs. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about buddy and peer mentoring programs. Some of them are featured in, in this slide. There's like a, a climbing course done with um, peers with and without disabilities. Um, in some camps, they spend time each week together doing a one-on-one -on -one activity or a small group activity or taking a walk on the Jewish Sabbath together. Obviously this impacts positively on, on both. Can't tell you how many kids have written their college write their college uh, essay about this experience. Um, one of the camps, the, the camp in Georgia, takes it a step further with their Disability Allies program for their 10th graders, where the, it's a combination of sort of frontal teaching, book learning, but also an experiential component. And the hope is that beyond camp, they'll go into their communities as really lifelong you know, advocates for um, inclusion and people with disabilities. One thing that I like very much is that several of the camps have joint plays. So at a, at a Ramah camp, as I said in the very beginning, Hebrew is really stressed. They'll translate a play like West Side Story or Lion King or Annie um, into Hebrew, or at least a modified Hebrew for younger people. And the, the, it's a very big part of camp. And in several camps, the disabilities program and the non-disabilities division will work jointly on the play, which is really very, which is spectacular. Uh, there are camp-wide trips. You know, camps have trips outside of camp to, to ball games or to amusement parks. Uh, the hallmark of every summer camp is color war. In Hebrew, it's called Yom Sport, Sport Day, or Maccabia, as you can see on the left slide. I mentioned trips out of camp or overnight trips even. Um, and again, the, the prayer experience that I described in a synagogue where a child with autism has a meltdown uh, and everybody turns around and shushes him or her is very different in camp where it's done in the most loving way. Um, you know, I, I've heard rabbis say that this child is communicating with God in his or her own special way, whether it's through words or through movements or singing or running around or through instruments. So that's a real highlight of the camp. Um, and then after camp, we, have, we try to offer some year round experiences. So many families wish they could trade the uh, one or two months of camp for 10 or 11 months of, uh, uh, of the off year experience. They would flip it around. So how does camp help? Sometimes we partner with uh, youth groups and religious schools to help them around inclusion. Um, we will have things like virtual get togethers. I have to say we've been doing this long before COVID came. We started something called either um, Shabbos is Calling, like a, a pre-Sabbath program we did on Thursday nights one camp is what's called Shavuot Tov, Good Week. On Sundays, they bring together people. They, they talk about the weekly biblical portion. They talk about, oh, it's snowing in Chicago. Oh, in Florida, it's really warm. So they, they get to really keep their context. Uh, they share stories. They just uh, goof around with their friends, with their staff. It's really, really special. Um, some, in some cases, there are reunions. Um, in Chicago, there's a critical mass of campers from Vermont, Wisconsin, who live in Chicago. So they'll get together for a reunion. Other camps do it actually in the camps, which are very nice. Um, and then when COVID hit, this is a, this is a very interesting. I'm sure everybody uh, in their in, his, in their organizations have had to shift a bit during COVID. Um, the Ramah camping movement, with its ten camps, did not operate last year. A huge financial loss, a huge loss to participants. But um, the camping movement decided to offer. Uh, some nationwide programming and also camping on the individual camp level uh, for all campers, the things like yoga and scavenger hunts and dancing and singing. 
but also some specific programs for campers with disabilities. We found when we polled our families that the parents of kids with the, the older uh, vocational participants with disabilities, they were worried that their, that their children would lose their job skills and their social skills uh, and socialization skills. So we, we jumped in and we started doing a nationwide, uh, we're calling it TICFA Net, for TICFA Network. We're now in our third cycle, our third eight week cycle with participants from Toronto to Southern California to Florida and Minneapolis and Chicago. Uh, we have staff members we put together a, a, sli a PowerPoint slide deck for each one. Um, it's, it's social in nature. It focuses on things like their cleanliness at an organization or job interviews or resumes or things like that, and is very likely to continue long past the pandemic. So just to kind of, to kind of bring things to a close, uh, when you're thinking about inclusive camping, I would say there are lots of different models and approaches. It's certainly not one size fits all. We're still evolving. And I like to say that for all of us in faith communities, it really is a religious imperative. It's not just kind of a nice thing. It really is something that we're, we're commanded to do. Um, in, in Judaism, we say we're created, but we're created in God's image. Um, we, whatever our faith tradition that is, um, everybody wants to belong and feel part of the community. We really have to push ourselves to do that. And as I note, it's really worth the hard work. So finally, uh, a couple, I'll leave you with a couple of things to think about, a couple of questions. What are some models of supporting campers with disabilities in a summer camp setting? What are some of the benefits and challenges of inclusive camping? There are many of both. And I guess most importantly, as you reflect and you think about your bringing this home, what are some aspects of 50 years of our experiences that you can bring back to your own summer camps? And if I could be of help, I'd be very happy to discuss this. There's me in the background on the bottom on an Israel trip. We took some of our participants to Israel. We've done that many times. Feel free to reach out. Um, I'm based on the East Coast. And thank you very much for your attendance.